Okay. Uh, let's recap what we learned last week. Uh, last week we discussed the continuous and discrete signals. Okay, this is again the second class of the review of the basics of signals and systems. First, we discussed the continuous and discrete signals, and here is a continuous signal, uh, which we call as analog. And on the bottom here, we see a discrete time and discrete value signals, and this is what we call as a digital signals, right? So in order to change, in order to convert from analog to digital signals, uh, we go through two steps. First is sampling, and the second is quantization, right? Sampling is to make the uh, continuous time to discrete time. Okay? You see that this is continuous time signal, and by sampling, you change this to the discrete time signals. And quantization is to change the uh, continuous value to discrete value. Okay? So this is still continuous time, but each value uh, is now discrete. You see a staircase signal. Right? So using these two techniques, uh, you basically change the analog signal to discrete, uh, the digital signal, like this. Okay? From now and on, uh, we are always dealing with this digital signal. So you always assume that we already have done the sampling okay, and the quantization. And these two steps are basically done by ADC, analog to digital converter. Okay? We also briefly uh, reviewed linear systems and one thing that you want to remember in the linear system is the superposition property so that's the basic definition of linear system and what the superposition property is that you can remember these two figures right we have two inputs and one output uh, you can first add these two inputs and make another input and then put that into the system you get a certain output Instead, what you can do is you have two inputs, and each input you put it into system separately. Then you get a two different outputs, and you are adding at the output. So first figure, you are adding at the input, and you get the output correspond to that input. And in, in this second figure, you get the uh, two outputs, and you are adding at the output. But if this system, T, this is the same system, right? Same system. If this system inside, this system is linear, then these two outputs are supposed to be the same. Okay, that's the definition of linear system. And when you look at this figure, right, this is the uh, like a characteristic of, the, of this system. And if this is linear system, like this, right, this is linear figure, linear curve, then you see that um, when you add these two inputs to make another input and put that into the system, you get this output. Instead, you can put these two inputs separately. You get these two outputs and add it, add this output. Then these two, these two outputs are the same if the system is linear. Okay? All right. Uh, we also discussed this a little bit of a convolution. And as you can see, in the convolution, we have two different convolution, uh, continuous time and discrete time. Basically, it's the same. Uh, you always want to remember this definition of convolution, right? FT convoluted with HT. And how to calculate is that you can choose either one. In this case, you choose the second one and flip it and slide, right? And slide and integrate. You can do, you can, you can flip the FX, it's okay. So either one, you flip it and slide it and do integration while, it's, while you slide it. Right? That's the definition of convolution. Same thing for discrete time. The only difference is that in this case, since this is discrete, when you flip and slide, you slide it like, uh, like sample by sample right? in discrete fashion. That's the only difference. Okay. Remember this th convolution definition, right? You have x because you, uh, yeah, because you are integrating with respect to x. So you have x here, but you have t minus x, and t is your time uh, time variable. So x t minus x. 
So this is minus x, right? Because you flipped it. Okay? Remember this definition. We'll talk about this in a little bit later today. Another basic uh, terminology, impulse response. As it, as it says, impulse response is the characteristic of a system. And, and what it says is when you put the impulse into the system, you get a certain response or you get a certain output. That's going to be impulse response because we put the input, uh, we put the impulse as the input. So this HN is going to be the response from this input, which is impulse, right? So that's why we call this one as the impulse response. Once you know the impulse response, now we can say we know everything. We know everything about this block. Okay, we know everything. This is basically a black box. We cannot look at inside, and we don't have to. Because once you put the impulse, you get the impulse response HN. Once you know HN, you know everything inside. Okay. After that, after you know the impulse response, now, later, what you want to do is you can put your own input, your own input signal into the HN, into the same block. <coughs> then. Based on this theory, we know that the output is going to be the convolution of the input signal, your own input signal, and the impulse response. We already know the impulse response from this, and this is your input signal. So of course you know already. So once you know these two, you can calculate the impulse response this way. This is the discrete time convolution, by the way. So by doing this convolution, discrete time convolution, you know what's going to be the output of the block. Okay? So that's uh, impulse response. So it's very important to know the impulse response and understand why we need this. Okay? We discussed Fourier transform and also uh, properties, some of the properties. Right? You see that this is a definition of Fourier transform and this is a definition of inverse Fourier transform. Uh, remember the analysis and thins synthesis. We discussed these things, right? So what was the analysis? It's like a prism. Okay? You get a uh, white signal, white light, and put this white light into the prism. Then prism will analyze the visible light, the white signal, white light, into whole spectrum, whole color of spectrum. So this analysis basically uh, changed the white signal, white light, into whole rainbow color spectrum. That's the analysis. And synthesis is putting all these different colors, different spectrum uh, back to the white light. Okay? That's a synthesis because synthesis basically means put everything together. So that's synthesis. So this Fourier transform is the analysis because what we are interested in is to look at the frequency component of the signal. And in order to see the frequency component or spectrum, spectrum is basically frequency. So in order to look at the spectrum or frequency component of your signal, you want to put your signal into the Fourier transform. Then Fourier transform will analyze and look and show you all of the spectrum or frequency components. And once you, if you want to put it back, now then all the spectrum or frequency components put all everything back to the inverse Fourier transform, and then this inverse Fourier transform will synthesize and put them all back to your original signal. Okay? So that's the analysis, synthesis. Okay? And here's the definition of Fourier transform, which is analysis function, analysis equation, and synthesis equation, inverse Fourier transform. Simple example, here we have a time domain signal and by looking at this time domain rectangular signal, we don't know how many or what kind of frequency component we have. We cannot see it, right? You can never see the frequency component here. So what we want to do is we want to put this signal into the Fourier transform. Then Fourier transform will give you this output. And what we can see from this output? Now we can see the frequency components inside this signal. Okay? You see this is a frequency domain, right? And you see that uh, frequency zero, which is 
DC, we have a pretty high uh, amplitude, or, or you can say power. And also, there are many other frequency components with its, uh, its own some amplitude. Okay? So you, we see that there are a lot of frequency components with some varying amplitude. Okay? That's the frequency component of this time domain signal. Okay? So by doing analysis or Fourier transform, we can see the frequency components of this signal. We call this one as a sync function, right? By the way, this is a magnitude of sync function. The original sync function, remember, is like a positive negative, positive negative, right? It's going up and down, up and down. But since this is a magnitude, right, we are only considering the, the absolute value. So all the negative value now flips back up, become the positive. There are many properties, but we are going to review only the important ones. Okay, all the rest of them you can review by yourself. Property four is a duality. What this duality means, we have uh, some time domain signal, for example, rectangular. Then take the Fourier transform to look at the frequency component or frequency response. This one is going to be sync function. Now based on duality, let's swap these two now the time domain is going to be sync. Then in the frequency domain, you're going to get the rectangular signal. So once you have a partner, become partner, right? Pair, like a rectangular sync, that these two, rectangular signal and sync signal, that they always come together. Even though you flip this domain, now the time domain is sync. Then frequency domain, it's going to be rectangular because those two are partner. Okay? Even though you switch it, still you get the same relationship like this, uh, except that you have a minus. Okay? You can always put, put this one into original definition of Fourier transform. You can always get this result. Okay? This, this show you how to do it. That's an example. Earlier in the previous slide, we see that in time domain rectangular signal, you get the sync function in frequency. But here, <coughs> based on duality, instead, you put the sync function in time, of course, you get the rectangular uh, frequency domain. But in fact, actually, you have a minus. But minus means you flip left to right. But still, it's the same because this is symmetric. Okay? But anyway, these two figure all, always, these two functions are always pair. You, you're, you know that, I guess, right? Now, property six, it's a frequency shifting. Before that, actually, we had a time shifting, right? So if you shift a certain uh, signal in time, what happened in the frequency? Let's say you have some time domain signal and you put the delay or time shifting. Then in the frequency domain, amplitude does not change or magnitude does not change, okay? What is changed is the phase. Okay? Phase is rotating in the frequency, okay? Remember that. And property six of frequency shifting. And the reason that we want to do this is that this is related to the modulation. And we'll talk about modulation next week, okay? Some of the basic definition of modulation. But before that, uh, you want to remember that when, when you have time domain signal, this is a, a corresponding frequency domain. Now in the frequency domain, you shift it. You, you change the frequency. Let's look at the figure. Let's say we have sync function here in frequency, right? If the frequency domain sync function, what was the time domain signal? It was a rectangular in time domain, okay? Originally, originally we have a rectangular in time domain. So therefore, we have a sync function in frequency, okay? That's the original, XT, uh, GT, and capital GF. That was the original signal. In order to do the frequency shifting, now we have a sync function in here in the DC 
we shift it into center frequency FC. Okay, now we shift it. This is modulation. Okay. Now once you shift it, what happened in the time domain, actually, we, we've done the frequency domain shifting. Okay? In the frequency domain, we change the frequency. By doing that, what happened in the time domain is that you see a, some uh, high frequency component multiplied into this. Okay? So this is actually modulation. Once you do modulation, we see this kind of signal. Okay, we'll talk about the details next week. Why we are doing it and what's the uh, what's the meaning of doing this? Okay, next week. But uh, this is some, some brief introduction about modulation. And mathematically, mathematically, this is the definition. So once you do the frequency shifting, instead of GF, we've done GF minus FC. So that's a frequency shifting. Once you do shifting, now in the frequency domain, we multiply this exponential J. Still, the envelope is same. Remember, this envelope is still same. Originally, it was rectangular. So still, we have the same envelope. It does not change into completely different signal. We still have this rectangular, uh, but inside the rectangular, we have this uh, uh, high-frequency sinusoidal multiplied to it. Okay? So we'll talk about details uh, next week. What we see in the mo property th 11, modulation theorem, is that, simply speaking, let's say you have uh, two time domain signals and multiply in prime domain. Let's say we have two different signals. Maybe one is a rectangular signal, another is triangular signal, <coughs> whatever, whatever it is. When you multiply these two in the time domain, then it's going to be another time domain signal, right? Because you multiply two different signal, now you create another one. It's like y t equals to this one times this one. Now put this one, put y t into the Fourier transform, you get another uh, frequency signal. Right? But that is actually the same as the convolution of two different things, two different uh, the, fre uh, the frequency signals. So g1 t and g capital G1 uh, f, those are pair. These two are pair. And also G2, those two are pair. So once you put this one into Fourier transform, you get this. And this one, put the Fourier transform, you get this, right? Put uh, multiplying time domain, same as in convolution in frequency domain. Okay, that's, uh, simply speaking, that's what it is. So see here, multiplication in time domain, uh, convolution in frequency domain. Okay? There was actually convolution theorem before that. What the convolution theorem means, when you multiply in frequency, multiply two different frequency, frequency signal in frequency domain, it's gonna be convolution in time domain, right? So we'll look at that um, a little bit later today. Okay, we'll, we'll discuss this one next week when we talk about modulation. Yeah, so this is convolution theorem. Uh, when you multiply two different signals in frequency, now uh, that's going to be the same as a convolution in time. Okay, Conv that's a convolution theorem. You can simply remember, right? Multiplication in one domain, <coughs> convolution in the other domain. Conv maybe multiplication in time, convolution in frequency. Multiplication in frequency, convolution in time. Right? Simple, simple like that. Uh, we didn't discuss correlation theorem last week. We're going to talk about correlation today. Okay. So what is a correlation theorem? Is that you can compare this one with convolution. Okay. This is called the convolution theorem, but this is a correlation theorem. The only difference uh, the only difference is that here, actually, you, it's a little bit confusing, but here you see tau, and you are integrating with respect to tau. And here, instead, you have a t, and you're uh, integrating with respect to t. So that's not important, because you can always integrate with any variable, right? 
So now, in order to compare these two, uh, let's change this t into tau, okay? And uh, let's change tau into t, just to just to compare these two. In that case, what you can see is this t becomes tau, and we are integrating with tau same way, and this become tau, this become t. So when you compare these two, difference between convolution theorem and in the uh, correlation theorem is that this one is flipped. That's only difference. So what does that mean? And also another difference is that you have complex conjugate on the, s on the uh, second signal. So that's only two difference. This one is flipped. Okay? Remember that, that, that one is flipped. We're gonna talk about details in the next slide. But that is the difference between the correlation theorem and convolution theorem. Okay? That's the only difference. Okay, we'll come back to that. Rayleigh's energy theorem tells you that whatever energy, the whole energy in the time domain should be same as whatever the total energy in the frequency. Okay, that's straightforward because you are not losing any energy by changing domain. So from time domain to frequency or frequency to time, still the whole energy you have in the signal should be maintained. Okay, you are not losing any energy, right? Still energy is same, so that's simple as that. Uh, we didn't discuss this one last week, but this is very important, some of the very basic ones. <coughs> okay. Here it says a Fourier transform or a periodic signal. We have a many different kinds of signals, right? Continuous time or discrete time signals, or periodic, non-periodic signals, deterministic or random signals. There are many different types. One thing that you will know to remember is we can see many, many periodic signals. Let's say sine, sine function, cosine function, that's always periodic. Sinusoidal is always periodic signal. So we see uh, periodic signals every day in many different, uh, many different systems. So what happens when you do the Fourier transform of a periodic signal? That's what we want to discuss here. It's not really easy and it's not we are not maybe, we are not that comfortable with these equations, right? By looking at this, it's not easy to understand. So let's look at this table. This table actually summarizes all these things pretty well. So let's take a look at it. Here, it's continuous time signals. See, continuous time. Th these area is continuous time signals. And this area is discrete time. Okay, the whole column is discrete time. Now, in this row, you see that this is a periodic signal. The whole thing is periodic. And the bottom here, this is aperiodic. The whole thing is aperiodic. So aperiodic means it's not periodic, right? Uh, not periodic is aperiodic. So there's no period. It does not repeat. That's aperiodic signal. First of all, we can look at this one, continuous time and aperiodic. This is like a random, pretty much. So there's no period. It does not repeat and it's a continuous time. In this case, here is a time domain signal, and here is a corresponding frequency domain signal. Now changing from time domain signal to frequency domain for this continuous time aperiodic signal, we need to do Fourier transform. So this is like a generic Fourier transform, and we see the definition here. We already know Fourier transform is defined in this way, integral. Why do we do integral? because it is continuous time, right? So we do integral uh, like this way. Then you see, you, you can see that uh, time domain signals now change to con uh, the frequency domain signals. Similarly, in order to convert the frequency domain back to time, now we need to do inverse Fourier transform. <laughs> and here is the definition of inverse Fourier transform. Again, this is the integral because this is a continuous time and also a periodic. So both of them, Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform, it's integral. Okay. So we know that, we know this. Now let's think about a little bit special case. And special case is that we are still in continuous time, but our time domain signal is periodic. 
Okay? You can always see it, right? Continuous time but periodic. In that case, this is a periodic signal. In that case, since this is a periodic signal but still continuous, you're going to do integration because this is still continuous time. So you can always do Fourier transform by doing integration. But since this is a periodic signal, you can do a integration like this way. So T or T sub P, this is a period. Okay? So instead of integrating from minus infinite to infinite, you are integrating only a one period this way. But still it's an integration. Now here's a question. Simply, let's say in time domain it's periodic. Then what happened in the frequency? Let's say in time domain signal, let's say this is a, a periodic signal. Then in the frequency domain, huh? the frequency domain is going to be, fre frequency domain signal is going to be discrete. Okay? That's important to remember. That's very important and very basic thing you want to remember. If there is a period, periodic signal in time domain, okay, and ten, then take a Fourier transform, go to the frequency domain, it's going to be discrete in frequency domain. So now you can see this in the picture, right? It's easy to look at in the picture. This is a periodic signal in time, still continuous, continuous but still periodic. Then take a Fourier transform, go to the frequency domain, it's going to be discrete, not continuous. Discrete. Okay? Okay, discrete. Let's think about another way. We were here, okay? We originally, we were here. Now, instead of continuous time, let's think about discrete time. But there's no period. A periodic, but discrete in time. Okay? A periodic, a periodic, but discrete time. When you have this discrete time, discrete samples in time, take a Fourier transform to go back to the, go, go to the frequency domain. Now you're going to have period. You're going to get the periodic signal. Okay. So in this case, time domain is periodic. Discrete time, uh, uh, the time domain is periodic. Frequency domain, discrete. In this case, Time domain discrete, frequency domain periodic. So what does that mean? That means in one domain, periodic function, the other domain discrete. Okay? If the time domain is periodic, frequency is discrete. If the frequency is uh, periodic, time domain is going to be discrete. Okay? That's what that means. But in this particular case, it is a discrete in time, but there's no period. It's not periodic, right? Now let's combine these two and think about certain time domain signal. And this, domain, this time domain signal is discrete and also periodic. Okay? Discrete and periodic. In that case, this time domain signal is a periodic, so therefore, frequency domain, discrete, <coughs> right? And the frequency domain, uh, periodic, it's going to be discrete here. So what that means is, if you think about periodic and also discrete, in the other domain, it's a periodic discrete, okay? So in time domain, discrete means frequency domain, dis the periodic. And in frequency domain, discrete, that means in time domain, periodic. Okay, remember always, always, always a periodic one domain, okay, periodic signal one domain, discrete in the other domain. Okay? So uh, if the time domain is periodic and also frequency domain is periodic, then both of them will also discrete. Because this is periodic here, which means frequency domain should be period, uh, discrete. If the frequency domain is periodic, then time domain should be discrete. So both of them are now 
uh, discrete and also periodic. Discrete, periodic. Typically, this is the one that we always see. When you do like a discrete time signal or digital signal, most likely we see these things and also this. Um, some of you are taking digital signal processing, right? DSP cores. In DSP cores, you'll see these things always. Look at it here. This is a frequency domain. This is also frequency domain, of course. But this is like analog frequency, like uh, zero hertz, one kilohertz, like one megahertz, things like that, right? This is a frequency no we know, like analog frequency. But now, once you look at the digital signal processing, instead of this, we are always looking at this frequency. And in this case, there's, no, there's nothing like one kilohertz, one megahertz. Instead, what you have is zero, phi, two phi. That's, you, that's the frequency you see. Right? Not, it's, not, it's no longer one hertz, one kilohertz. This is an analog signal. And this is a dis discrete signal or digital signal. In the digital domain, okay, in the digital domain, we always see this kind of frequency. We call this one as a normalized frequency or digital frequency. So you need to understand exactly what this basically means, why we call frequency as this way instead of one megahertz, one kilohertz. But you need to be familiar with this definition of digital frequency, okay? So because we'll see this one all the time later. You see now the definition of Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform. Once you have discrete samples, of course you always use sigma instead of integration. Only when you have a continuous time, you're gonna get integration. And now once you get the discrete time, of course you're gonna get sigma because now discrete time, right? discrete samples. Okay. So nothing important, nothing um, difficult. So that's why this is the integration, this is sigma, because this is discrete. And why, why do we have discrete time, discrete signal in frequency? Why we have discrete here? Because periodic, it's a periodic in time. So periodic in time, discrete in frequency, since this is a discrete, we have sigma, not integration, sigma, right? So pretty easy to look at, right? So remember, uh, periodic in one domain, discrete in the other domain, okay? Uh, one thing here, um, speaking of DSP, as I said earlier, when you look at the DSP, now instead of looking this frequency, we are always looking at this frequency, right? In DSP, why is that? This is analog, and we are always looking at the digital or discrete signal, we always look at this frequency. Why is that? As I said in the first slide, how do you change the analog signal to, di to digital signal. First thing to do is sampling, okay, sampling. This is an analog signal. And when you do sampling, of course you need to select the sampling frequency. And based on the sampling frequency, now you are doing sampling. Once you do sampling, now you are gonna change this continuous time signal into discrete time signal because you do sampling. By doing sampling, you are changing the analog to uh, continuous time to discrete time signal, okay? That's the purpose of sampling, right? Once you do sampling, now in time domain signal, it's gonna be discrete. So since this is a discrete in time, it should be periodic in frequency domain, okay? That's what I said, right? One domain discrete, the other domain periodic. So now we now the frequency domain it should be dis, it should be periodic. So that's why you see this kind of frequency all the time. Okay, once you talk about DSP, now we are gonna look at this frequency domain, not this one. 
Okay. So we will come back to this one later when you have a chance. Okay. And and by the way, uh, this one actually probably should be covered by DSP course. Okay. But uh, if we have a chance, we'll cover it later. Uh, this is uh, some of the basic terminology. An another basic ter terminology. In signals, we have two different kinds of signals. One is called energy signal, and the, the other is power signal. So let's uh, look at uh, the definition of these two. Energy signal are the signals with a finite signal energy and also zero average power. So that means Look at this picture. We are basically thinking a infinite time. Okay, I'm showing you only this time domain because we cannot we cannot draw the infinite time, but basically this one goes infinite. Okay? But look at this signal. This signal only have non-zero value within this time. And all the other one is all zero. <coughs> right? Certainly this one has a finite energy because energy is only here, okay? We only have energy here. So this one is finite energy, but this one has a zero average power. Why is that? As I said, this one goes infinite. So when you do average it, you need to put a certain duration for average, right? But this one goes infinite. So when you do power, when you, do, when you calculate the average over the whole infinite, it's going to be zero anyway. Because when you integrating over infinite, this one becomes so tiny, it becomes zero anyway, right? So average power becomes zero. <coughs> Here is the definition of energy. So when you integrating from minus infinite to infinite with this signal, but this signal, let's say this is a one, and this period is two. Let's say this is a two. And this is amplitude is one. In that case, how much is the energy? So this value is going to be one, right? So it, you, you have a, some small value. It's a finite value. And this finite value, you're going to integrate it. It's going to be zero, right? It's a, so some, some, some value, not zero, but some value. So what that means is this signal, the energy signal, you have a finite energy. But the uh, power, average power, is going to be zero. That's the energy signal. So typically, you can simply think that this energy signal is like some, some signal like this. You have only non-zero value with a limited re range. That's a signal, energy signal. It's a little bit easier to compare, to com easier to understand when you compare these two. What is a power signal? Power signal looks like this. And power signal has the infinite signal energy. You have energy infinitely. You, you still have energy all the time. That's infinite signal energy. And this one has a certain finite average signal power. So now let's look at it here. When you take the average of the whole duration, uh, you're going to get a certain uh, constant value. In this case, you have a signal like this. So probably the average signal power is going to be somewhere in between here, maybe this one, somewhere. Right? Think about that. <coughs> you are integrating over the whole region. Then you are going to get a certain constant power. right? So that's a power signal. You can easily look at the difference. right? This one is energy signal. This is a power signal. You can see the difference. Okay, that's the difference. And here's the definition. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, the main topic today. Some of you probably heard about autocorrelation, right? What is autocorrelation? Basically, in English, right? What is the auto as a prefix? What does auto mean? In English words, right? You always have a prefix. <laughs> Auto something means itself. Itself. You put something, it, okay? Generally. 
So autocorrelation basically means you want to calculate the correlation by yourself, by to yourself. That's autocorrelation. Okay? Simply speaking, here's autocorrelation. Mathematically, first of all, it's defined this way. This is basically the mathematical definition. When you look at this, it actually is very similar to convolution, right? It's actually very similar to convolution. But what's the difference between this one and convolution? You have a complex conjugate. That's one difference. But the, the main thing is, this is flipped. Okay? In convolution, original definition of convolution, you have tau minus t. Right? So that's the definition, original co uh, convolution definition. So the difference between the autocorrelation and convolution is that this is flipped. Okay, so here uh, is a simple example. Where do you, okay, typically, right, when you look at this equation, autocorrelation, it's, I cannot, you cannot understand, right, generally. Uh, so let's take a look at some example. Let's say, uh, What does it look like? Oh yeah, radar. <laughs> I'm not that good at uh, drawing, but uh, let's say this is radar and we have airplane, something like that, let's say. How does radar work? In antenna, radar antenna, you transmit some signal. And in this case, let's say we are transmitting, uh, let's say this is time domain. Let's say we are transmitting this kind of signal. As a, this is just an example, okay? This radar is always transmitting this signal, just transmitting. Now what happens is if there's nothing, okay? If there's nothing, this transmitted signal goes infinite and nothing comes back because there's nothing. But if there's an airplane or some other things, what happens is this signal is transmitted, eventually reflected and bounces back to me, right? The same signal is bounced and back to the antenna. So this signal is transmitting, transmitted like this, and if there's airplane, it bounces back and it come back to me. And when it come back to me, of course, it, it's gonna be flipped, right? Because this one goes first and this one will be following. It bounces back, so it's gonna be the opposite way. It comes back like this, right? Now what happened in the radar is that this radar is transmitting this signal and after you transmit, it basically watch it. It basically uh, look at what is coming, okay? Let's say maybe in one second later, you receive this, or some other times, maybe in 10 seconds later, you get this. Then what does that mean? What's the difference between you getting that, this signal in one second or in 10 seconds? That's the distance, right? So when you get this, basically tells you how far this is, right? The distance. If the, your airplane is very close, you're gonna get this signal back in one second. If the airplane is far away, maybe it's more time, right? Now then, the question. How does this radar know that you're gonna get this signal? This is your own signal, but how does this, this radar know that, okay, this signal is comes back. How does it know? Huh? How the radar knows is that the, this radar is always 
calculating autocorrelation. Okay? You are not going to monitor this signal in time. You cannot do it because this is so fast. Your transmitting comes back very fast. You cannot really see uh, you cannot really see in real time to see these things, right? It's not, it, that's not really right way to do. Right way to do is you are calculating autocorrelation this way. So let's see how you do it. Let's say this is XT. This is our own signal, XT. Now, uh, let's say this reflective signal, we call this RT, receive signal. But now the problem is that we don't know when this is coming back because we don't know, right? Maybe there's airplane uh, maybe just a hundred meter away or maybe there's the airplane like a several kilometers away or maybe there's no airplane. So we don't know when this is coming. We don't know whether this is coming or not. We don't know anything, right? In that case, what this guy does is that this airplane, this uh, radar, at least this radar knows that we transmitted this signal. And we are basically expecting the same signal. Now that you see that this one and this one, it's flipped, right? It's flipped because it's reflected. It's a flipped compared to this. What you do is that you can do a correlate. What is the basic definition of correlation? Auto means you are comparing with yourself. That means auto. Correlation it means correlation means that how similar you you have these two signal. How similar these two signals? That's a correlation. So how you do it is that You can always calculate the correlation of your signal with the received signal. Okay? You are always correlating. So here's what happened. Let's say this is the XT, your transmitted signal. Let's take a look at in time domain, whole time domain. Let's say at this point you transmit. Okay? You transmitted this signal. And a little bit later, this is over time. Now this signal is moving this way and comes back, let's say, in one second. Let's say it takes only one second. So a little bit one second later, one second later, now you're, you're going to get this signal. So this signal comes back. Okay? In one second later, you basically receive this signal. Right? What you are actually doing is that Throughout this whole time, you are basically calculating the correlation. What that means is you are shifting. You first flip this. The x minus t means you flip it. So let's flip it. When you flip this, it's going to be this signal. This signal now is going to be sliding. Think about the um, convolution. That actually is uh, almost same as convolution, right? As I said, the only difference between the convolution and this autocorrelation is that this is flipped. That's the only difference. In convolution, you know that, let's say, convolution of these two, let's say Ft looks like this, and Gt looks like this. Looks like this. Now, how to do convolution is that you flip this and slide, right? Slide. Same way here. Here, this is uh, your receive signal. And now, this is your original signal, but flipped. Slide in time. Once you slide and doing the same calculation in convolution, you do the same calculation. 
Now what happens is, let's say here's the, uh, I'm trying to draw a output of the autocorrelation here. So basically the autocorrelation calculation is that this x minus t is going to be sliding, keep sliding like this. When this one slide, let's, let's say you slide. When you slide here, you are doing calcul the, this autocorrelate calculation with this one and this. Then what's going to be the value? Zero because there's no overlap. Let's keep sliding. You have this somewhere here. Now you have a little bit of overlap. So you have a little bit of value. Keep going. Then when this one matches exactly, you're going to get the peak value. Still keep moving. Then it goes away like this. Overlap a little bit. It goes down, goes down. So when you look at the autocorrelation, the output of autocorrelation is always like almost zero. It's not zero exactly because there's a noise. Always there's a noise. So you have some small value and suddenly it's increasing. And there's always peak and goes down and again zero. You always get this kind of signal uh, as an output of the autocorrelation. And what does that mean? That's the time. When you have a peak, that basically means that this is the time that you see the match. Earlier I said you see this in one second or maybe 10 seconds. What does that mean? This 10 seconds is from here to here. That's 10 seconds. Because this is the time that you found it. Okay? This is the time you see the match. From here, when you start, up to here, when you find the match, that's the 10 seconds or one second. So based on this time, now you can guess what is the distance. Okay? And another thing, when you have this peak in autocorrelation, what that means is uh, you received matching. You, you, received, uh, uh, you received this, your own signal. So think about this way. Let's say there's no airplane. Still, we are calculating autocorrelation. We are always calculating autocorrelation. If there's nothing, then nothing, no signal is coming back. Nothing is reflected. In that case, what will be the autocorrelation? It's always like this. It's always. Because nothing is coming back. Only when my signal is coming back, then this received signal is matching with my own signal. So since there's a matching, you have now peak when you have a match. Right? So that's the main uh, kind of reason why we do autocorrelation, and this is how to do it. And the main difference mathematically, mathematically, only difference between the convolution and the autocorrelation is that this is flipped. That's the only difference. And why do we have a conjugate here, convolution conjugate? Because sometimes this xt is complex value. You have a real plus imaginary, a plus jb, something, something like that, right? Sometimes. In that case, you need to have complex conjugate. If this is a plus jb, you need to have a minus jb because complex conjugate. But in, in this kind of case, let's say in radar, you are transmitting some signal. And this signal most likely is real, not imaginary, not complex value. If the xt is real, then you can ignore this. Because in real value, complex conjugate means nothing, right? If the xt is complex value, then you want to put the complex conjugate. But still, remember this is flipped, okay? Like a x minus t. And since this is autocorrelation, autocorrelation, 
you are correlating with xt with your own xt. Same thing, right? Same thing. Because remember here, I'm transmitting xt and I'm expecting a reflected signal is also xt. My own signal is reflecting. So I'm basically correlating with my original signal with the reflected signal, but reflect signal is still same as mine, right? So you are correlating with my own signal. So that's why we call this one as autocorrelation. So auto. Okay. And typically when you look at the autocorrelation, you always see a peak, right? And here, the peak point, the peak point here, we typically want to call here the pick point as the tau equal to zero. Okay? So tau, what is the tau? Tau is a delta. What is a delta? You are basically correlating two signals, your own signal and uh, your own signal and your copy of your signal. You are basically calculating the um, correlation between these two. But if you have a little bit of mismatch in time, mismatch, then there's a time difference, right? That's delta, that's tau. So tau equal to zero means it's perfectly match, like, like this, right? It's perfectly, you perfectly match, exactly match. That's the time, that's the, the, that is the time that you see a peak. Because it's perfectly match, you are gonna get the maximum value because it's perfectly matched in time. And that's the tau equal to zero because the mismatch, time mismatch is zero. Now you have a little bit mismatch, let's say tau here, somewhere here, for example, tau equal to, let's say one, something like that. That means you have a little bit of mismatch. So you are, this is your own signal, but we have a little bit of mismatch one like that right so since you have a little bit of mismatch tau equal to one now you're not going to get the maximum value you get some value but not the maximum so you get some some value like this not the peak peak you get the only you only get the peak value when tau equal to zero so simply speaking when you draw the autocorrelation here's autocorrelation Typically, we write the autocorrelation as this way, r x tau. It's a function of tau, r x tau. x means we are doing autocorrelation of x, x t, x t, right? So that's why we say x. And tau is this one, the, the mismatch between these two. So it's always like this. When you get, this is tau, when you get tau equals zero, you always get maximum. When you have a tau uh, higher than zero or lower than zero, you get small value. Eventually, it's gonna be zero. You always get like this. This one and this one same, right? Basically same. And the only difference is that we are talking about tau. And what is a tau? Tau is the time difference between these two signals. That's only difference. And this is how to write the autocorrelation here. So here you see that this is the one that you have a tau equal to zero because we define the autocorrelation this way, Rx tau, and when tau equal to zero, it's gonna be like this, okay? And tau equal to zero means you put zero here, zero here. Then it's gonna be, this one is gonna be same as this. And what is this one? This is the energy of xt. So what that means is when you have a peak here, peak, you're gonna get the whole energy in the signal. That's gonna be the maximum you can get because the, you get the energy of that signal, the whole energy. That's that, that's, that happens only when these two signals are exactly matching. In other words, tau equal to zero. That's when the two signals are matching exactly you get the energy at that point, which is a peak, okay? <clears throat> That's the autocorrelation. So when you look at the autocorrelation, remember this radar example. I think this is simplest example, easy to understand, right? 
in radar, you are transmitting some signal and you want to receive your own signal after reflecting, right? So you just keep sliding because you don't know when you are, when you are receiving this reflection. This reflection comes maybe in one second, maybe 10 seconds, or maybe it never come, right? You never know. So you are basically correlating, sliding all the time. And once you find the match, exact match, you get pick like this. Okay? So that's all the correlation. Now another thing, there is a cross correlation. What is a cross correlation? Again, this is a correlation like the autocorrelation. So this one is also trying to match or trying to see the, how much these two signals are correlated. But this is not autocorrelation, but cross autocorrelation. What that means is now you are calculating a similarity between two different signals. In the earlier, in the autocorrelation, you are trying to do correlation with your own. So XT and XT. Both of them XT, right? XT and XT. So you are trying to calculate the correlation between you and your own. Okay? Your own. That's auto. But in cross correlation, you are trying to do correlation with one signal into another. So we are having two different signals. In this case, this is not uh, autocorrelation and this is different from radar. So let's think about similar example. Let's say we have XT like this and now we have YT but we, let's think about two different YTs. And one YT, one T, Y1T, let's say looks like uh, this, let's say. And Y2T, let's say looks like this. So as you can see, we have three different signals, okay? XT different from this one, and this is also different. We are talking about three different um, signals. Cross correlation is again trying to calculate how close, how similar these two signal is, right? So we are always trying to find out uh, how much similar these two. So let's say we want to calculate the cross correlation. Of XT and Y1T, let's say. Or XT and Y2T. So let's say if you calculate the cross correlation of these two, these two and also you co cross correlation of these two, which one has higher value? Huh? With Y2, T, why is that? This one probably has a higher value of cross correlation. Why is that? Because these two are similar. These two are completely different, but these two are similar, right? So that's what it is. How similar it is, that's the correlation. But in this case, this is a cross correlation because we are talking about two different signals. But still we are, the concept is same, okay? You are trying to calculate the similarity with these two different signals. So simple example, we get some value of cross correlation, but these two, probably we are getting a little bit higher value of cross correlation. Now then question, we had autocorrelation and remember that in the autocorrelation in the radar example you always get like peak right right so let's say that this peak value is uh, let's say e this peak value is e in, in auto I'm talking about autocorrelation in the previous autocorrelation that's E. Do you think the higher value, large value of E is good or small value is good? Large value of E is always good. Why is that? 
easy to distinguish, yeah, exactly. So what that means is, let's say you have a radar, and you can, we, in the previous example, I just make this kind of signal, just, just an example. But when you create radar signal, right? This is just an example, right? You can always send any signal for radar. When you transmit some signal for radar, how do you select the signal? How to design the signal, how to design is that you're gonna design the XT that gives you the maximum E, right? That gives you large E, okay? Large E always good. Large value of autocorrelation is, is always good because let's think about this way. In a certain XT, let's say you calculate the autocorrelation and your autocorrelation is like this. It's very small E, very small peak value. In that case, you always get noise, right? And you get uh, some autocorrelation and still noise. In that case, it's, it's, it's not easy to detect. Right? Not easy to detect because it, it, it everywhere you have a noise and even though you have a peak, this peak value is almost similar to noise. In that case, we don't know. Maybe this is noise or maybe peak. We don't know. So that's why it's always good to have a large peak for autocorrelation. That's always a good. And that value, the peak value, depends on your signal. And how to design the signal, uh, how to design signal is, is related to the peak value. Now, then, let's think about cross correlation. <coughs> let's say in this cross correlation example, let's say this cross correlation and this cross correlation, now you have a two different examples, right? And we know that this one probably has a higher value. So in this cross correlation, generally, in general, cross correlation also has the, this kind of, this one let's say is like something like this, and this one also like, like this, right? Because this one is also same calculation anyway, you're gonna get the same calculation, autocorrelation, convolution, um, cross correlation, everything is same, because everything is like integration anyway. So you're gonna get the this figure. Some, something like this figure. Which one is better? Higher value is better or lower value is better? Why? Wha lower value, why is that? Is it to distinguish between what and what? Uh, generally, you want to have a higher autocorrelation and also, generally, you want to have low, small cross-correlation. So for cross-correlation, it's always smaller is better. Smaller is better. Why is that? Why is that? Because in cross-correlation, we are basically, basically trying to correlate two different signals. These are two different signals, not the same one, different, right? So we are, we are basically considering two different signal, but these two are similar, that's not good, right? That's not good. That's the cross correlation. We want to make these two different, as different as possible, because we are talking about two different signal. So always for cross correlation, we want to <coughs> minimize it. That's always better, generally. So when you have a two different signals, but signal looks similar like this, that's not, oh, not a good way to design the signal. This is wrong, wrong way to design the signal. You need to make sure that when you have a new signal, your new signal should be different because this is a different signal, right? You need to make it different. That's the right way to do it. So the cross correlation, you want to make it small, if possible, right? Make it small. But uh, other than that, definition is the same. Uh, again, this one is a function of tau. Here are x, y, because we are doing correlation of x and y. So you write it this way, r, x, y, tau. In the autocorrelation, we have x and x. 
That's why R x tau, only one x, but in, in cross correlation, you, you're writing like R x y tau. Tau is the same thing. You have a peak. In cross correlation, again, you have a peak at some point. And this peak, whenever you have a peak, that's the point that you tau equal to zero. Same way in autocorrelation. <coughs> uh, when tau equal to zero, again, when tau equal to zero here, put here zero, then it's gonna be like this, right? It's like this. So here is a very important one. Maybe some of you heard about orthogonal. What is orthogonal? Uh, it's different from independence, actually. It's, it's a little bit different. What is orthogonal? Orthogonal basically means this one. This is original definition. So what that means is you have a x t, some signal. You have another signal, y t. There's no correlation, zero correlation. That's orthogonal. And this is the definition, right? How do you measure the correlation? When you look at the correlation zero, that means you need to calculate the correlation. And that calculation becomes zero. This is how to calculate the correlation. So once you calculate the correlation between x and y, and that becomes zero, that means x and y is completely different. No correlation. That's orthogonal. That's original definition orthogonal, okay? We actually, we use, uh, this orthogonal property in many different systems, okay? Many different systems. So this is very useful, very useful. But this is the original definition of orthogonal. Since x and y is orthogonal, that means no correlation, okay? Correlation becomes zero. That's orthogonal. So as I said, cross correlation is always better to have a small value. So eventually, zero, that's perfect. What cross correlation zero means completely orthogonal, right? That means like a perfect so somehow. Okay, so that's uh, that's what happened. Uh, yeah, so this is one property of a cross correlation. Uh, some other thing, we have an energy spectral density, and later we see the power spectral density. Uh, uh, let's, let's discuss this one in next, next week, okay? Because we want to look at a little bit more details about these, these things. 